um, June 3rd, we're going to have Pastor Greg Degrees here, and uh, some of you might remember him for the, on the Thursday night, he, he did not preach, but he did minister some in our service, and uh, just a great, great man, I know that you'll enjoy him on that Sunday morning. Um, also, uh, this Wednesday night, I've asked uh, Dr. Elisa, who is president of the Austin Peay University, to be our speaker. Uh, or yeah, there you are. Raise your hand. Um, you, I, I know that you're really going to enjoy her. I'm really thrilled to have her and Elliot as part of our church. And so I want to encourage you to, this Wednesday night, make a special effort to be in the house of God. Uh, God is really adding to our church some real quality people, and uh, we're proud to have them and excited about hearing the word of the Lord. Um, the songs that we sang today really go along with what I want to talk to you about. Um, this is heavy in my spirit. Um, really want to preach about faith today. And uh, faith, the Bible talks about this in Romans, talks about it in Galatians, talks about it in Hebrews. Um, the writer Paul, I think, is quoting from maybe Hosea, but, um, or Habakkuk, probably. Scripture says this, the just shall live by faith. Faith is the essence of what keeps you and I going. It is believing that what we're doing uh, is going to pay off. In fact, God loves faith. I don't think there's anything greater in the believer's life than faith. Faith works in every phase of your life. It works when you're sick. It works when you're broke. It works when you're prosperous. It works when you're in the valley or on the mountain top because faith is not tied to your circumstances. It's tied to this book. Yes. Hallelujah. And that's why the just shall live by faith. And, uh, faith was something that Jesus could not resist. There was something about people that had faith that, that got a hold of Jesus. In fact, uh, I was just thinking as I was sitting there Oh, such an insignificant person to the time that she lived in. She was not relevant. She was overlooked. Nobody gave her the time of day. And she was the widow that came to church with all of the wealthy. And when it came offering time and, and all of these great businessmen and wealthy people were dropping in large sums of money. The scripture says that Jesus was present. And he's sitting off to the side and he's watching what's taking place. And he's watching these men as they would drop in huge sums of money. And probably they're thinking, boy, I hope that he saw what I gave. And then along comes this little woman, this little widow who is broke. Her husband is dead. She has no sons to help generate income. And, but she feels drawn to the presence of God. She feels drawn in the house of the Lord. And, and as she's watching this offering take place, she reaches down to the bottom of her little leather pouch and she begins to feel through the few mundane things that have become collected in that bag and finding nothing but way down in the corner perhaps she feels a small coin and the scripture called it a widow's mite. It would be equivalent to about a penny or so of what you and I would have today in currency. And, and she reached in and she got a hold of that. It was her last bit. And she proudly got up and she shuffled her way over and dropped it in that bat, in that in that offering plate. And, and maybe people snickered as they watched what she gave. But Jesus, hallelujah, instantly came alive. And he placed her in the annals of history. That insignificant little lady. Why? Because he saw something in her that he was looking in everybody to find. And it was called faith. Amen. 
And that moment she dropped it in there, Jesus looked at one of his disciples and he said, see that lady right there? She just gave more than everybody else put together. And he said, but Lord, how can that be? He said, because they gave out of their abundance. But she gave out of her need. And he said, when she gave out of her need, she reached over into that deposit called faith. And she released it. And today, hallelujah, one of the greatest stories in the Bible to teach the principle of giving is told, hallelujah, of a little lady who had no wealth, no income, no accumulation, no real estate. Yet God says this is the one because she had something that the other men did not have and it was called faith. Faith. Jesus couldn't resist it. It was almost like what kryptonite is to Superman. Faith is to Jesus. When he gets around faith, it makes him do things that he normally wouldn't do. And here comes the centurion man to Christ. And then he told the Lord, he said, my servant is home sick and about to die. And he said, I need you to pray for him. And Jesus said, okay, I will. And, and the centurion said, no, I don't need you to come to my house. He said, because I understand authority. Because I'm a man that's over men. And I understand authority. And he said, but I can tell you this. He said, I recognize in you authority. And he said, you move me in my faith. And he said, I don't need you to come lay hands on him. I just need you to speak the word. And when he said that to Jesus, Jesus said, oh, he said, I have never in all of the troubles that I've had found such great faith in all of Israel because this man had such faith in the word of God. Amen. In fact, Luke 18 and 8 says this, that when Jesus finally returns from heaven, he says this, he will be looking for one thing. He says, when he comes back, will he find faith? Doesn't say, will he find great buildings or large churches or great universities? It says, will he find faith? That's why the writer Paul with such illumination and revelation of, of the things that the Holy Spirit taught him in that secluded three and a half year period simply said this, the just are going to live by faith. There's different kinds of faith. There's, and I'm, I'm sure God loves them all. There's faith that you and I have for divine healing. If I asked you to raise your hand today, everybody in this building would raise their hand and say, at some point, I had believed God for healing. Some of you right now are believing God for divine healing in your body. It's a wonderful faith because it says that we believe in the atoning stripes of Christ that James talks about by his stripes we're healed. There's faith that you and I invoke for financial blessing. How many has ever asked God to help you pay a bill? When you're so broke, you don't know how to make ends meet, but you, you stepped over to the world of faith and you challenged God. Help me in this area. And God comes through. And, and God loves people that challenge Him to believe for divine healing or challenge Him to help them in their areas of finance and, and both of these for divine healing and financial blessing both are taught so much today in the spirit filled movement that they're considered commodities that belong to the believer and they are scripturally the other kind of faith and there's many it's called the common faith it's called great faith it's called wavering faith it's called instant faith scripture talks about the one that, that we probably would somehow identify with is faith for personal salvation. None of us today would be here 
if we had not had faith to believe that if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says to every man is given a measure of faith. That's talking about he puts in the heart of human beings the ability to reach out and grasp a hold of a belief system that says there is a creator that loves me and will forgive me my sins and save me. So those are all great kinds of faith. But I, th I think that there's another kind of faith that I want to preach about today that, that moves Jesus the most. It's a faith that I think that just gets a hold of him like nothing else. Psalms 116 and 15 says this, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The word precious means, amongst many adjectives, rare, costly, prized, highly valued. In the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And the word saints here literally means Faithful ones. David wrote this. He said, when a saint dies, a faithful one dies. And they die in faith. That God says that kind of faith is highly prized in heaven. It's costly. And it's rare because not a, a lot of people are able to do that. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, the writer's talking about some men and women, and he said, These all died in the faith, not having yet received the promise. And when I read that, it hit me. They died, but their faith didn't. And see, for us as believers today, especially in this grace movement and this prosperity movement, we don't realize it, but we almost have this entitlement mentality that God owes us prosperity, that God owes us a great life, that God owes me to fulfill my destinies. And because we, we've had that kind of talk bred into us and we hear so much preaching about that that God wants you to be abundantly wealthy and have everything that you want and that Christians don't suffer and, and that, that we're the head and not the tail and we're the lender and not the borrower all of these things that what happens is is when, when we begin to go through a trial and we begin to go through a battle we don't know how to equate that battle with the theology that we've been taught. But can I tell you, the Bible says, All who are righteous shall suffer persecution. And many are the afflictions of the righteous. So your love for God deepens. Hallelujah. Not when you're on the mountaintop, but when you're going through the valley. And God is talking about a kind of faith. And what do you do when God doesn't come through? What do you do when they die and you go to the funeral? What do you do when your house gets repossessed? But you've been a tither. I'll tell you what you do. You just tell God I don't understand that but my feet are planted on the rock of ages and my faith will not be moved. What kind of faith is that? That's rare faith. That's costly faith. That's men that stand on the word of the Lord. See, when you get a hold of that kind of faith something happens in the heavens. Hallelujah. Something begins to change in the spirit realm. In Ephesians 1 and 20, it's talking about where Jesus is right now. And for 
his whole lifetime and then the three and a half years of ministry when Jesus was on the earth, he did awesome things. He dealt with a lot of things. He accomplished a lot of things. He taught principles. He laid the foundation for the apostles and the doctrine of the church. Went through that horrible time of crucifixion and rejection. And when he came up out of resurrection, he stayed 40 days and then the Father brought him on home. And Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, that Jesus now sits on the right hand of the Father. You know where he's sitting in rest. That's why at Calvary, his, some of his last words, he says, It is finished. And he left the earth never, hallelujah, to come back again until the second coming of Christ. And so today when you think about Jesus, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. He is in the position of rest. He is in repose. And then he's not, he's not coming out of that place until prophecy is fulfilled. In Acts chapter 6, the Bible says that the disciples decided that they were being, they in such demand, and they were being so stretched that they could no longer wait on tables, take care of the widow's needs. They wanted to devote themselves to prayer and fasting. So they said, we're going to choose some men that can take care of these menial tasks and allow us to operate in ministry and the laying on of hands and, and miracles and preaching. One of those that they chose, his name was Stephen. And in the book of Acts, when you read about Stephen, said that he was full of the Holy Ghost and he was full of wisdom. And then you go back a little farther in the chapter, it says, and he was full of faith. Over time... Stephen waited on tables. He wasn't considered the inner circle of those men that got to preach into the large crowds and do the miracles. And you know, when, the, when they were done and they're having meetings, he's one over there. He's one of those serving and cleaning up. But he was full of faith. Stephen, the Bible says, began to operate and do great miracles. And he got out one day and he begins to preach. And as he begins to preach, he's preaching about Jesus. And the anointing of the Lord is on him. And he's preaching about the crucifixion of Christ. And, and the audience begins to get convicted because Stephen is preaching such a didactic, undeniable principle that they realize this guy is preaching at us. And the scripture says that the more he preached, the angrier they got. Until finally they couldn't take it anymore. And the Bible says that this crowd rose up against Stephen. Now picture it. Here he is. He's preaching the gospel. He's defending Jesus Christ. And the scripture says that this crowd came against him. And they began to be so angry with hatred. Somebody picked up a rock and let it fly. And as he's preaching, it hit him in the side of the head and, and blood began to trickle and somebody else picked up another stone and they threw it in it and it hit him in the eye and cracked the oracle, oracle around his, the, the orbit right in here and blood began to...
in heaven. The Bible said that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And oh, here's Jesus sitting on the throne next to the Father in rest. And all of a sudden, as Stephen begins to die in faith, Jesus said, I can't take it anymore. And the angel looks, and here comes the Son of God. He begins to stand up on his feet. Hallelujah. And they said, what are you doing? He says, I've got to honor somebody that's got this kind of faith. And Stephen brought Jesus to his feet with the Spirit of the Lord. And that Stephen's dying. He said this, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Let me ask you, has your faith ever made Jesus stand up? Has your faith in the midst of the storm been so profound that you made Jesus stand up? Because he couldn't take it anymore. And he said, I've got to stand up in honor to the faith. Amen. Governor Akrakola of Armenia was com confronted with mutiny. Forty soldiers refused to offer the sacrifice ordered by the emperor. The 40 who stood before him that wintry 4th century day were fine specimens of manhood who radiated an aura of courage. He was determined to make them see reason. But the soldiers were adamant. They refused to sacrifice. To do so was to betray their faith in Christ what about your comrades, said Agricola. Consider you alone of all Caesar's thousands of troops. You're defying him. Think of the disgrace that you would bring upon your legion. To disgrace the name of our Lord Jesus is still more terrible, replied the men. Exasperated, the governor threatened to flog and torture them. But the soldiers stood firm, although they knew he would carry out his threat. In the fourth century, there were no civil rights. And boldly, the men answered, nothing you can offer us will replace what we would lose in the next world. As for your threats, we despise our bodies when the welfare of our souls are at stake. Pairs of guards seized each man, dragged them out into the cold where they were stripped and tied to posts. Whips laid open their backs and iron hooks tore their sides. Still the forty refused to surrender. Agricola chained them in his dungeons. Finally he commanded that they be stripped naked and driven onto the ice of a pond. The rebels as they were called, did not wait for sentence to be imposed, but tearing off their own clothes, ran to the pond in the raw March air. We are soldiers of the Lord and fear no hardship, they said. What is death for us but an entrance into eternal life? And on this day, March 9, 320, singing hymns, they stood shivering on the pond as the sun sank. Baffled. The governor ordered hot baths placed around the pond. Surely the warm water would lure the men off of the ice, but the crisp night air carried a prayer to all ears. Lord, there are 40 of us engaged in this battle. Grant that that 40 may be crowned and not one be wanting from this sacred number. History says one of the men did lose his nerve, however, crawled off the ice to a bath. He died instantly when he touched the hot water. It was too much for one of the guards. He shucked off his clothes, marched out onto the ice, and took the place of the man who had failed. I want God, hallelujah, to do a work in us. That we quit looking at God as some sugar daddy. And that when he doesn't come through in prosperity. And he doesn't heal us when we want. We want to shake our finger and say, how dare you? The faith that God's looking for is not in his healing. 
not in his wallet, not in his hooey power, but God says, I need some men that just believe in me, that when I don't come through, when I fail, it looks like that you just simply say, I don't understand, but I know this, I am persuaded that my God is able to keep that with I committed unto him against that day. Get some faith that I make Jesus stand up. No wonder we have such an anemic church. Our relationship with God is based on how much money he puts in our pocket and whether we drive the car that we want and live in the house that we want. But can I tell you, there are over a million people in the last five years that have gave their life across the earth as martyrs for the name of Jesus. 2015. In fact, my wife just met one of these at the mall, Coptic Christians composing about 10% of the population in Egypt. 2015, under the guise at night, they raided homes and began to pull men out while their wives and children watched. The ISIS, ISIS did it. In fact, it was video around the world on the internet. They took these 20 Christian men that don't know what we know about God. They don't get to have this kind of church. And when they left, they didn't get to get in the vehicles that we have. Oh God, I'm so spoiled. I know I am. And I, I look at it, the price. The Bible says life is in the blood. You know what gives power to the church? It's men and women, hallelujah, that don't care whether God comes through or not, but they're so committed to Christ himself. So like David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Can I tell you that Jesus doesn't owe you anything? The moment that we cross over into eternity. We used to sing a song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. Hallelujah. The things of earth. will go strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. For what does it profit a man. If he gains the whole world. And he loses his own soul. They took these 20 Coptic Christians out on the beach. You can see a picture of it on the internet. And Isis stood behind them in ninja looking outfits, faces hid, because the devil's such a coward. With swords in their hands and simultaneously the Isis cut the heads off on all 20 Christian men because they would not recant the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not minimizing cancer. I'm not minimizing being divorced and your spouse leaving you. I'm not minimizing burying a child. I'm not minimizing struggling financially. Hallelujah. But listen. Whether he comes through or not in this life doesn't really matter. What does matter is with the moment that you step over onto the other side. The rich man Lazarus never got healed. He lay at the gate with sores and the dogs would lick his sores. But his faith was in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord said uh, while he was on this earth he didn't have a whole lot. But when he got to his other side uh, the Lord said you're not coming in as a beggar. You're not coming in as a man that's in lack. But you're coming in uh, with the robe of righteousness uh, and the king's 
son. Can I tell you, hallelujah, God's challenging us in this hour. Give me some men and women that'll make Jesus get up over the throne and stand up. And the angels walk him up. And he's got his hands up. They said, what are you doing? He said, the faith is in the resting place. I ain't seen anything like it. The Jericho will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. When will he come through? I don't know. But I know this. That God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And in the midst of the valley, you got to get on the rock of ages and declare, I shall not be moved. Your story of three Hebrew children, we read it, but I don't think we really understand what happened. Faith that you can have where you know God ain't getting me out of this. If I hold on to this faith, I'm a dead man. And you say, I'd really be dead with the last breath in my mouth saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Then to live the rest of my life in comfort, knowing that my faith failed my Savior when he needed me the most. And when those three boys, young men, stood there and that king told him, he said, you're dead men. Unless you get down and bow. They said, we won't. They said, whether our, our God delivers us or not. Mm-hmm. See, that's what got them through. Was they had reached a place in the Lord. It didn't matter. They weren't looking for deliverance. They were looking for faith that wouldn't let them bow. You can't make deals with God. You can't say, well, I'll serve the Lord as long as he does this. But if, if you know, I, I, ever so often I've heard people say, well, I'm mad at God. That's cutting your nose off spite your own face. Because he's the only one that's a friend who stick it closer than a brother. Right. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> there is a place in the Lord that you will learn to value your eternal life more than your natural life. That that, you understand, has such more significant value. And when they heated up the furnace and they tied them up, and Shadrach's looking at Abednego, and, and I don't know what their conversation was, It could have been, I love you, man. They thought they were dead. But they would not bow down. This is what I, I, if nothing else I'll leave with you today, this is what I want to leave with you. The faith that Jesus is looking for is the faith that we just believe in him and not what he can do. I just believe in him. And regardless of what happens in my life, and regardless, I can be like those who died in faith, not receiving the promise. What happens if God doesn't answer that prayer that you pray for 10 years? I had to ask myself this. What happens if this is the best that resting place ever gets to? Can I still stand on this platform after what I prophesied and believed? Can I still stand on this platform five years from now in this warehouse and still preach that I believe in faith? Or is it that we feel like God wasn't fair and God wasn't right? We have to have faith, hallelujah, that whether we receive the promise or not, that we still, hallelujah, believe in the authenticity of the Lord. Because I can tell you this. 
You put a price on your faith, the devil will pay it. If your price is, God, if I, if I could just get that big house, then that, that's all that I want. Or I get that individual married, that's all I want. The devil will pay your price. Because he wants your soul. And when they begin to <clears throat> be ushered to that fiery furnace and they're tied and here they go and they're marching to death. I don't know if they were singing a hymn or not, but they knew that they were fixing to die because at the entrance were men already dead who had heated up the fire. <clears throat> All I know about the Godhead is it says that Jesus was the Word before he was in the physical body incarnate. He was, the Bible says, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And there are theophanies in the Old Testament where I believe that Jesus appeared to people before he was ever formed in the womb, the natural body in the womb of Mary. And the Bible says great is the mystery of the godliness and we don't, we'll never be able to fully wrap our minds around it. But it's very possible that the word, hallelujah, who became flesh already lived in that eternal body that physically looked like the body that was going to come out of the womb of Mary when it was full grown. Because the Bible says, hallelujah, that the word was with God. He was in heaven. But when those three Hebrew children. With the faith that they manifested. When they walked into the fiery furnace. Fixing to die. All I know is the Bible says. That the king looked in. And he said. I see somebody that looks like the Son of God inside the fiery furnace. I, this is what I think happened. I think the Word who was with God before the foundations of the world that was in heaven, hallelujah, got up and walked out of glory and walked down into the fiery furnace. And those men made Jesus, hallelujah, slain before the foundation of the world. Stand up and he hung out with them. God give us some men and women in this hour that their walk with God is not based on whether they're healed, whether they got money, whether they got the wife they want, or they're not being fulfilled in their dreams. But oh, give us some men and women and I'll tell God whether you come through or not, whether you give me what I want or not, I'm not backsliding, I'm not going down. But with the last breath of my body, I will declare the name of the Lord. I'll end with this. 19, in 1555, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley were burned at the stake in Oxford for their Protestant convictions. As the flames leaped up, Latimer calmly said, Mr. Ridley, be of good comfort. We shall this day Light such a candle by God's grace in England, I trust, shall never be put out. And they lit him on fire. And these two men burned to death with the praise of Christ coming out of their mouths. May God deliver us from this comfort mentality that in this day and age is such a struggle even to show up for church. And I'm not indicting us. We are a product of our environment. There is really no nation that has been blessed like we have been blessed. But Lord, help us to stop taking for granted the wonderful privilege of being able to say the name of Jesus without being struck dead. Hallelujah. That we all of our weaknesses and faults. That we can still come into the holiest of holies. And touch the name of the Lord. 
Not everybody should have to die a martyr's death. But can I tell you, every one of us need to have that kind of faith that will make Jesus Christ stand up. Hallelujah, that will make him stand up. And the angels say, what are you doing? And he said, I can't help it. I've got to stand up in honor of the faith that I behold. Stand with me today. I don't know where you are in your personal walk with God. We just had a prophetic conference. Many of you received words of the Lord about your ministry, your, your destiny. And as much as we dance around the issue, God doesn't heal everybody. My wife and I had a great preacher friend, wonderful man she could preach. She had such faith. We preached for her and her husband over the years. <clears throat> she came down with cancer. It was incurable and it got so bad that it began, she began to bleed out the sides when she would take a shower and just eat and through. She died in great pain. We prayed for her and prayed for her. And God did not hear her. But can I tell you, she went out praising the name of the Lord. I preached for another man over the years. He actually gave my wife one of the first words prophetically about the bridge ministry before she ever started it. He and I did a lot of presbyteries together. He had a church. They built a new building. He had close to a thousand people in his church. Got saved in the hippie movement. Had hepatitis C from the drugs that he took before he got saved as a young man. I went and preached for him three weeks before he died, and he was so frail. He was still believing. <clears throat> that God was going to heal him and raise him up. And yet in the wee hours of the morning, life for the last time slipped through the lips of Pastor Gerald Davis. And he crossed over into eternity. Left a church that was fatherless, that has never recovered. You say that, I don't understand how God is a God of mercy and says, I will heal you of all your diseases. How that can happen. Listen, there are times in your life that a preacher or a counselor doesn't have the answers. There's no solution. There's no, there's no answer. Nobody can tell you this is why. That's when you got to reach down and get a hold of a faith that doesn't make sense. That defies logic. That just simply says, I see you, Jesus. I don't begin to understand. I can't make what you said work with where I am. But I want you to know, I believe in you. I believe in you. And God stands up. Hallelujah. And says, I can't sit in this kind of faith. But I got to stand up because you moved me. wherever you are today. If you want that kind of faith, maybe you're in a place where you're struggling. I don't know. But I pray that as your pastor, God, hallelujah, will put faith in me that nothing can separate me God will put faith in you that when blows of life hit and they come and you read a scripture that says that shouldn't have happened but it did you can say great is thy faithfulness oh God my father hallelujah I invite you today, if you feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit, 
to come stand with me in this altar and that you would tell God today, Lord, whether you come through for me or not, whether my dreams are ever realized, whether this pain ever leaves my body, whether my ministry is ever what I thought it should be. I just want to affirm to you today that God, you said I'll never leave you. So Lord, today I tell you as this church, we will never leave thee. We will never forsake thee. Hallelujah. And though, Lord, we are assaulted on every side, our faith remains. Hallelujah. Hear me by the word of the Lord. Don't let the enemy 
The Bible says don't love the world and don't love the things that are in the world. Why? Because your heart only has so much room. And it won't expand. And when you have the love of God in you, but you start putting in the love of the world, you know what happens? It pushes out the love of God to make room for the other love until eventually your heart is full of the love of the world and the stuff that's in it. And we start thinking, but I'm not a sinner. I don't sin. I love. I go to church. I'm not looking at pornography. I'm, I'm not full of hatred. And we don't realize that. Faith, the scripture says, only works by love. And if you're struggling with your faith, you might need to go back and ask yourself, am I in love with Jesus or am I in love with his abilities? May God, hallelujah, bring us to a place. I've heard people say as I close, it'd be in a movie or something, a guy, you know, spit his neglected his wife and just worked like a workaholic and bought the house and you know the jewelry and the car and all of that and they're in trouble in their marriage and
Christ, Mr. Latterer, we have lit a candle that can never be put out. So Lord, take this word today that's been released and brand it on our souls. Wake us up in the middle of the night tonight. And when we get up in the morning, let us begin to sing, great is thy faithfulness. And God, may we realign our priorities. Lord, that we would fall in love all over again with you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. I'll let Jasmine sing us out. Stay in the altar. Come on. Don't forget Wednesday night.
Hãy subscribe cho kênh Ghiền Mì Gõ Để không bỏ lỡ những video hấp dẫn.